Right. So, Shavua Shechalbo, Tisha B'Av. And so we know that Tisha B'Av is very closely uh, connected with Hebron. How is it closely connected with Hebron? Because um, Tisha B'Av was the time when the Meraglim returned from their 40 days. And uh, we're all acquainted with this famous Gemara uh, in Yoma, which says, Migdar Shishon, Mitnei Mach Rev, Mitnei Shoshah Dvarim Shayubo, Avoda Azara, Giloy Arayot, Shfichut Damim, Aval. Mikdash Sheni, Shayu Oskim Batora, Mitzvot, Gmilut Hasadim, Mipne Mach Rev, Mipne Shaita Bo Sinat Hinam. So we're also very much acquainted with that, and we're also acquainted with the great efforts that at least uh, in the Vray Torah and in the press go out during the week of Tisha B'Av to tell us about the terrible Sinat Chinam that it was then, <laughs> and uh, etc. So perhaps we could see what we can do today. In any case, um, so we said this is the, the events of Tisha B'Av, the events of the Muraglim, are closely associated with Hebron because uh, when did this hatred Intra fraternal. Well, How's that? Infiltrate? No. In fraternal. Brothers. Fraternal. I know something more than Tony in English. That's <laughs> feel good. It's almost, it's almost like explaining something to Josh. And, you know, oh, I just was trying to get your attention. <laughs> anyway. Um, so when did this hatred start? And did it, in fact, end? Because what we explained in previous weeks was that um, the Galut Mitzrayim started when Yaakov sent Yosef Me'emek Hebron to, uh, to the brothers, right? And who were these brothers? So if we go back to the psukim that precede Vayishlachei Umeimek Hebron, we notice a number of things. First of all, we notice that um, that's not a good thing. Let's try this one. I'm looking for a pointer. Okay, anyway, uh, so we notice, first of all, that the brothers were mostly upset about the fact that Yosef wanted to be king. Hamaloch timloch aleinu. That seems to seem to be the most um, distressing thing as far as the brothers are concerned. They repeat it twice. Vayamru lo echav. Hamaloch timloch aleinu. Im mashol timshol banu. In other words, the Sina seems to be closely associated with the fact that Yosef is indicating that he wants to be the king of the brothers. Who should this, which of the brothers should this distress the most? Yehuda. 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 wants to be the Bechor, and he wants to get his he wants to get his double portion. Okay? Yosef can be king. He'll still get his double portion. Okay? But uh, Yehuda is expecting to be king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fact remains that in this incident, when, when Yosef comes to the brothers, etc., uh, etc., et 
whose whose word goes, Yehuda. As a matter of fact, uh, Rashi explains when it says right after they sell the sell Yosef, Vayered Yehuda me'etechav. So what's the Vayered? So he said because the brothers blamed him. Why did they blame him for? They were all equal partners. Okay, so they blamed him because he was the leader. So we have here the uh, number of elements that I want to point out. One is the fact that Yosef wanted to be king. Two, the fact that they, as a result, they hated him by Yosef Otsnoto. Okay, and a third element which the Pasuk adds, which is Vayekanu Boechav. In other words, there's an element here of um, jealousy. jealousy. Okay. And we all know that as a result, uh, that Yaakov sends him from Emek Hebron, and we already explained tediously, perhaps over a couple of weeks, that this is all tied in with the Brit Ben Aptarim. Uh, and the, the first part of, of which is Ger Yez Aracha Be'eretz Lo Lehem Ve'avadum Ve'inu Otam Abam Me'ot Shana and this all starts here and therefore when when Kalev comes back to Hebron and ah, we also explained that both Yosef went to the Merat HaMachpelat to try to invoke Tfilot uh, in the Me'arat Machpela to help him against his brothers. Similarly, Kalev goes to the Me'arat Machpela by Yavoat Hebron, and at the end of the process, um, 40, 45 years later, 45 years later, after the sending of the Meraglim, when um, Kalev says, I am now 85, and I was 40 when Moshe sent me to. You weren't here last week, right? Ooh, that's what happens. So, uh, 45 years ago, Moshe sent me, and if you remember, he says, I'm just as strong as I was then, implying, of course, that you're not. Not implying, you don't have to imply. The Pasuk says clearly. Yoshua, vayi ki ki zaken Yoshua, veharetz nishara arbe maod un un unconquered. In any case, last week we explained how Kalev makes this very extensive speech in which he convinces Yoshua to give him chivro. And at that point, it says, "Al ken ha'ita chevron lekalev ben Yifune, yan Hashem milei achrei Hashem elkei Yisrael." And that basically we see as the end of the Brit ben Aptarim promise, because the end of the Brit ben Aptarim promise was v'dor revi'i yashuvu hena. And we already established earlier in our lessons that the Brit ben Aptarim was made in Hebron, and therefore what well, we always assume that Heina means a fourth generation will come back to Eretz Yisrael, which is true, but it could, we can learn it even more specifically, and that it's the fourth generation will come back here to Hebron, and in fact, Kalev comes back to Hebron. So that is where the hatred started, and the question is whether uh, Kalev succeeded in putting an end to this hatred. That's, that's really the question. In other words, we asked last week why Kalev insisted on getting a Hebron. There were a lot of good reasons why he should give up on Hebron. It wasn't, according to the Midrash Rashi brings, it wasn't the greatest place in the country. It was the worst place in the country. So why, why was uh, Kalev so insistent? And we tried to explain that Kalev had more important um, uh, ideas in mind, more that were important to, to the nation, and part of the, those ideas was to forge the nation together. And um, 
this is, we, we brought a number of reasons. We said that Kalev had a Ruach Acheret, which valued the connection to the forefathers. He understood the fulfillment of the Brit Ben Abtarim of Doravi Yashubu Heina. And on a more specific way, he said, okay, that's very nice. I understand these things, but how are we going to do it? How are we going to unify the nation? How are we going to do it? And here he, he felt that since Hebron was destined to be the royal city, as it was compared to Tzoan, which was the royal city of uh, Egypt, he understood that uh, from the royal city, a king, a king should be the one that could possibly unify the nation. And therefore, he wanted to uh, have uh, Hebron from where he can try to unify the nation. Nevertheless, uh, and, and Kalev, we also explained that Kalev saw himself as the one that should be unifying the nation. Okay? Which, and he says it very clearly to Yoshua. He says, uh, Moshe sent me, God promised me, you're old, I'm powerful, young, and well, he's not young, but he's, I'm just as vibrant and able as I was 45 years ago, uh, is clearly challenging Yoshua's leadership. And, but nevertheless, the fact remains that for 45 years, despite the fact that he felt that he should have been named leader by, by Moshe in Parashat Pinchas, when uh, Moshe says, Yivkot Hashem Elokei Aruchot, so Kalev explains last week that in Pashat Pinchas that he is ready to laviem uleotziem. Nevertheless, he accepted Yoshua's leadership for this period of time, but he understood that, or at least it was his opinion, that in order to go, in order to uh, unify the nation. You can't do it with what he considered imposed leadership. That's my term. But imposed leadership means he was a, Dem he was a Democrat. In other words, he didn't think that the nation would be unified by the fact that Moshe appoints, or Hashem, appoints Yoshua for a number of reasons. First of all, Malasot, Yoshua is from that very tribe that the other brothers rejected. rejected. And, uh, but if Hashem said Yoshua, so, and, and the people didn't accept that so well, but nevertheless they said Malasot. But Kalev saw that this was going to lead to further fraternal conflict. <laughs> and therefore, his idea was that there has to be a leader from Shevet Yehuda. He would be acceptable to all the tribes. And uh, that leadership has to come about by Acceptance by all the tribes. It can't be that the way Moshe and Yoshua were were um, appointed, which was by Hashem, because uh, why you can't argue with Hashem, but if um, if the people don't feel that they have a, a, a part in choosing their leader, they're not going to follow him. Maybe Moshe, Malasot Moshe is Moshe, special person. But, um, and therefore, if, and the fact remains that Yoshua, unlike Moshe, unlike Moshe, who said to Hashem, you have to appoint a successor, Yoshua does not ask for a successor, and he does not appoint a successor, which leaves a vacuum. Into that vacuum, Kalev certainly saw himself as entering. Huh? Candidate. Strong candidate. Okay.
but actually we don't see it in the, in the, what happened to Japan. We don't see we that? We don't see that that was the lead. Right, he wasn't. We'll see why, perhaps. But uh, clearly his, his concept that Hebron is the place where um, the royalty will start and it's the place where there will be unity uh, did win the day. And Kalev was successful in getting the first <coughs> Nachala, as we explained last week. Why was Yoshua, well, let me ask the question differently. Was Yoshua agreeable to all this or not? So we talked about this last week. Um, if you read the parasha simply, after Kalev makes his big, long uh, speech with all the arguments, it says, So you could say, yeah, Yoshua agreed. But if Yoshua agreed, then Kalev wouldn't have had to, first of all, come with all the, you know, all his uh, strongmen, all his bouncers. Um, he could have just talked to Yoshua offline and said, okay, you know, Hashem promised me. You know Hashem promised me. So, en baya, nachon. But the fact is that Kalev had to make a, a very strong argument and threaten Yoshua Kanire before Yoshua agrees and uh, raises two questions. Threatened him how? Excuse me? Threatened him how? Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that, okay? Uh, physically. <laughs> but I'll, I'll come back to that. But first, um, the question is why didn't Yoshua agree? Why did Kalev have to make this whole big thing? And the second question is, why did he agree? In other words, okay, if we can explain why he shouldn't agree, so why did he agree? Any ideas? Well, Caleb was at Hebron when he went to, to spy out the land. He was the only one. Okay, so? That's part of it. Part of what? Of, um, the reason that he should be in Hebron. Right, that's what he says. He says more than that. He says, God... And Moshe said that you're going to receive the land that you tread on. And since the land that I tread on was Hebron, then God promised to me what it's a no-brainer, as it says in the Torah. Right? So what's the problem? Why does he have to come with a with a whole army? Uh, and there are a number of reasons. If we read the Pasha again carefully, which we're not going to do again, because we'll spend the entire evening on it again. But if, if you remember the parasha and his arguments, he's clearly not just asking for Hebron. He's saying, you're old, okay? Uh, I am able to lahaviyem u lahotziyem, just like I was 45 years ago. Lahaviyem in the lahotziyem is code in the Torah for leadership. That's what Moshe says. If God Hashem Elokei Ruchot Lachol Basar, Ishal Aida, Asher Yivim, Asher Yitziim. When Kalev says to Yoshua, "I am able Laviim Ulotziim," he's saying, "Step aside. Step aside. Your day is gone. You're old. God told you you're old. As a matter of fact, not only are you old, and not only are you incapable, not not only are you incapable, but you failed." I'm not saying you failed. God's saying you failed. God says, and Hashem says to him, I see that you're, that, the, that you're not doing what I told you. Hashem says almost, step aside. The only thing I'm asking you to do, I have one rule request. Give out, give out the nachalot. I'll take care already. I'll take care already of, to, 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 to capture. Okay? But at least do that. So that Kalev almost is not saying anything terribly bad that, that, that Hashem didn't tell him. I mean, Hashem, there are certain things that Hashem is allowed to, to say, and Kalev uh, is being a chutzpan in saying it. But 
but the fact remains from a factual point of view. That's number one. Number two, it seems quite clear that Kale's request is not Kale's request is I want Hebron without a Hagrala. I want my portion out out of the competition. out of the rules of the game. I want it extra game, extracurricular. I don't know how you say it. I want it. B'toch shevet Yehuda, but kodem kol bo nikba she etze ani mekabel lelo kol agrala lekol lo lo kol shum davar. Lekabel shevet Yehuda ani lo b'tuach, but I think that the result of this is that the shevet Yehuda basically kabel et nachalato lelo agrala. Uvda, fact is that the fact is that. When they go to Shiloh to give out the real Hagralot, it says clearly that only seven Hagralot were given out, which means that Shevet Yuda and Shevet Yosef, including Ephraim and Chatzim Menashe, also received their. Uh, in other words, things started falling apart because what happened? Shevet Yosef looked at. At, at, at Yehuda, and they said, well, if they can get, if they can get without a Hagwala, why not us? Okay? Bekitzo, Kalev's request or demand of Yoshua was not Tamim. It was not uh, 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 an innocent, it was not an innocent request that says, look, Hashem promised me Hebron, so you should give it to me. Because if that was all it was, it would have been it would have finished in one pasuk. Instead it took 15 psukim because Yoshua said, no, 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 no. So we understand now why Yoshua said, no, 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 no. Now comes the question why at the end it says, vayavalcheu vayiten lo et Hebron. Not only did it give him Hebron, but apparently the implication is that he also gave in and gave him the gave him the command of the army. Mm. And why did he do this? If he didn't want to, and if he thought it was not what you were supposed to do. Because uh, because if you look in Shoftim, Perak Aleph, where which sort of reviews what really happened, if you look at Shoftim Perak Aleph. Uh, here. Ah, interesting. So in Shoftim Perak Aleph it says, "Vaidnu lekalev et Hebron, kasher diber Moshe, kasher diber Moshe." So that sounds innocent enough. Moshe actually did tell uh, Kalev that he was going to get Hebron. But if we look at the parallel pasuk back in Sefer Yoshua, in Perak Tetvav, pasuk Yud Gimel, if I remember correctly, yeah, it says, "Ulekalev ben Yefune, Natan chelak betoch bnei Yehuda el pi Hashem lehoshua." That's a strange statement. We just read in Sefer Shoftim that. Kalev received Hebron al pi Hashem biad Moshe, which is true. So here's an interesting pasuk. Kalev ben Yifune natan chelik betoch bnei Yehuda el pi Hashem. Also an interesting lashon el pi Hashem. It only appears 
three times in the whole Tanakh, El Pi Hashem instead of Al Pi Hashem. I don't know if I want to talk about that now. El Pi Hashem, Li Hoshua. The only conclusion we have here is that if God hadn't given Yoshua a strict order that says, Yoshua, I know this is going to be a difficult pill to swallow, and I know you don't understand why, because this is not what's supposed to happen, but you do what do as Kalev requests. And therefore, that explains why, after all the entire speech in which Yoshua clearly objects, okay, suddenly he gives in. He gives in because he received a order from Hashem to do so. Okay, let's move on. Nevertheless, we have, from our point of view, from our Hebron point of view, we've established Hebron as the place which potentially, and not only potentially, because we know the history, is going to be the place where the tribes do finally unite, which will show exactly that they mamash unite in Hebron. And that is very, very, very significant. As a matter of fact, I think... I, I copied this from the Parshanut of uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, who explains in Parshat Chayei Sarah the significance of the purchase of the Merat HaMachpelah. In so doing, he also touches upon the meaning of the word Hebron, as Samson Raphael Hirsch likes to do. And he, he too says, Hebron is not just stam chibur, but it is the most intimate union. That's where the word chevron comes from. Now I'll read what he says, which is very beautiful in general. Okay, it's not 100% in line with our, our uh, uh, what we're talking about, but it's very important as far as the Emirat HaMachpelah is concerned and the meaning of chevron. So he says like this, he says that uh, it's called a machpelah because by its natural formation of, of dual burial spots, okay, it seems to have consisted of rows of double caves and by its natural formation to offer itself a home for married couples who were united in death as they were in life. As indeed Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Yitzchak and Rivka, Yaakov and Leah, <laughs> Yaakov and Leah, all found their last resting place on earth there. Then he goes on to a real Hersheyan statement, and he says, the first possession which the Jewish race received of their land was a row of pair of graves a row of pair of graves, which the first Jew bought to be used for his wife and then for himself, and for his son and his grandson and their respective wives. So Hirsch is trying to say, the, I'll read, the thought of the value of the family tie, which attaches the heart of husband to wife and children to parents, was henceforth inseparably connected with the Jewish land formed henceforth the fundamental trait of the character of the Jews and enabled them to become what they became. He says that not only is it romantic, which he finds very important, that it, 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 it puts together the man and wife, but at the same time it combines generations together and all of them together with the land. Perhaps the name Hebron, which henceforth was added to the place, also came from this. For Hebron means the intimate union, the most appropriate name for the close intimacy which makes Jewish men and women grow together in unison as husband and wife, 
as father and as father and mother. Centuries later, when their descendants had flourished into a great nation, no daily offering was allowed to rise from the height of Moriah, from Mount Moriah in Yerushalayim, before what he's saying here is the Korban Toda, the first Korban of each day, which had to be uh, brought at the crack of dawn, but never earlier, required that the Kohanim, the priests, make sure that the crack of dawn has cracked, has come about. And therefore, the, the, uh, the Gemara says, the Gemara in Yuma says that the Kohen would call out to the guy on the roof, the Kohen, the Kohen was on the roof, the lookout, and say to him, is it dawn yet? So he would say, yes. So he says, no, 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 no. Has the light gotten as far as Hebron? If it got to Hebron, then it's light. So he explains, centuries later, when their descendants had flourished into a great nation, no daily offering was allowed to rise from Mount Moriah in Jerusalem before the priestly herald at the turret of the temple could see the rays of morn shining on the graves of the patriarch and matriarch at Hebron. Kibud Av Va'em is for Jews the preliminary condition for and the root of Kibud HaMakom. That's Hirsch. That's Hirsch, which is beautiful. But at the same time, we learn a few things about Hebron. First of all, the fact that Hebron, uh, as Kaleb understood it, was a place of union. And as Kaleb really understood, it was, it was closely connected to the Emirat HaMachpelah and the Avot HaUmah. This is the Gemara, if you want to see it. Tanya, I have even brought it in English. It was taught in a Baraita that the sages disputed the precise expression that was employed in the temple. And it was, what did the Kohen say to the lookout? Okay, so there's a machloket, but it doesn't matter. Nechama, nach, Nachuma ben Apakshion said, he, the herald, the, the, the lookout has to say, Af barkai bechevron. There is even light in Hebron. But Matya ben Shmuel says, Hamemune ala paisot, the, the, the person who was in charge of the lotteries, says, Heir penei kol hamizrach, ad shebechevron. He's supposed to ask in these terms, is, has the light reached Hebron? If so, then we can then we can start the day, basically. Yeah. So when did the majority of Jewish people get out of their rest? Last about a year and uh, <laughs> we'll get to it. In any case, we we know that uh, David was anointed first in Hebron, not first, first in Bethlehem by Shmuel, but then he was anointed king over all of Yehuda in Hebron, where he was king for seven and a half years. And then when the union happens, which we'll see, he became king of all of Israel, and that too took place in Hebron, as we'll see in a second. Yeah. No. 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 Which one? You talking about the third anointment? When Shmuel anointed David in Bethlehem straight from Hashem, at Kedekach, that Shmuel said, "Huh? This this gingy over here, you know." Which point? No, they didn't even know about. It. Nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. Right, at that point, right. 
Well, first, first the, 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 the Zohar asked Bichlal, why did, if David's going to end up at the end, at the end he's going to end up in Yerushalayim, right? That's the goal. The goal is to end up in Yerushalayim. So why did he have to be king in Hebron, Bichlal? Yeah, but why? Not only that, we ha- in Shmuel Bet, it says, as you can see over here, it says, Vayishal David Bashem Lemo Ha'ele Biachat Arayuda. After Shaul dies, David feels a little freer to move around. Till then, he was hiding with, in the, with the Plishtim. So now he feels better that he can go around. But now he's he's checking whether Hashem thinks he should go back. He should go into Eretz Yehuda. The answer he gets is Ale. Kurt, Kurt, answer. Vayomer David, Anna, Ale. Where? Yehuda is big. Where should I go? Vayomer, Hebron. So, this raises a side question, which is, David didn't ask Hashem everything. Okay? And so if he wanted to go to Yehuda, and if he wanted to go to Hebron, I guess he would have done it without asking. In other words, one could possibly come to the conclusion that this is not what he wanted to do. Okay? Uh, not I don't know about the first one. Maybe he wanted to go back to Yehuda. But once he got the green light, once he got the okay to go to Yehuda, he could have gone to Bethlehem. Or he could have gone to any place in Yehuda that he felt comfortable becoming king. Um, Hebron was a big city and an important city, uh, and therefore he could have gone to Hebron without asking. Why does he ask? Where was Shaul's palace? Shaul's palace? In North of Yerushalayim, Giva. In Giva Shaul. Giva Shaul, it's right, out, right near uh, Pisgat Zev. Huh? Benjamin, right, close to the, close to the border of Yehuda, but Benjamin. In any case, one could understand from here that he wasn't very excited about going to Hebron. He was not. Why? Why? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> that's a good question. Well, we'll get back to that question, perhaps. But, right. Okay. In any case, the important part of what the Zohar says is that the reason David had to become king in Hebron for a while is also to get that same connection which Caleb had over the generations when, you know, when the people come into the land, etc., etc., like our children or our grandchildren uh, who are already born in the country, both the children and the grandchildren. So they obviously can't have the same feeling necessarily of Aliyah, etc., etc., as you had when you came in Aliyah 50 years ago. Right? Therefore, you have to think of ways to connect them and try to re- reconstruct that feeling. And that's exactly what the, I think the Zohar is saying here. He's saying, Mipnei she David en lo lekabel malchut at she yitchaber im ha'avot she bechevron. In other words, what Kalev saw as obvious, maybe uh, uh, hundreds of years before, was not so obvious anymore. By the by, the time everybody was established in their in their. Now to answer this, here's, this is what the pasuk says when the nations when the when the other tribes come to uh, appoint, ask David to be king of everybody. I'll read the Psukim. You can read along with me. If you see some place where it says Hashem, stop me. Okay? But you won't stop me. No, 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 no. no. That, 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 I'll tell you in a second. First of all, notice the, right in the beginning. Call Shifte Israel. Did I say unity? I mean unity. Call Shifte Israel. 
ויאמרו לאמור, הנני עצמך ובשרך אנחנו. Can you think of something more united than to say, I am your flesh and blood, I am you. You are me, I am you. הנני, הנני עצמך ובשרך. We are one. That's the best definition I can think of for union. Okay? הנני הננו עצמך ובשרך אנחנו. גם אתמול, גם שלשום, בהיות שאול מלך עלינו, אתה היית המוציא והמביא. המוציא והמביא? You are the real leader. המוציא והמביא את ישראל. ויאמר השם לך... No, 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 not now. Then! ויאמר השם לך, אתה תראה את עמי את ישראל. You will shepherd my, my nation. All these Israels that I'm greening here, that I'm highlighting here, is to point out that we're talking about the entire nation of Israel, not Yehuda, Yosef, Benjamin. They keep repeating, Al Yisrael. Vayavo kol zikne Yisrael el ha-melech, vayichrot lehem ha-melech David Brit, lifnei Hashem. No, come on. וימשכו את דוד למלך על ישראל. אוקיי, אז אתם רואים מזה פסוקים, שזה הכל קם כמו, איך אתם אומרים את זה באמריקה? גראונד סוואל, משהו כזה, אוקיי? איך? הם הכל קם ביחד. עכשיו אני אקרא את הפסוקים כמו שהם באמת כתובים, לא כמו שאני קראתי אותם. Actually, it's just what I wrote. The only difference is that every place where there's a three dots, it says Hebron. The point I was trying to make was that it's all the, the, in, in, the infusion of Hebron into these psukim is completely superfluous. The psukim read perfectly well without Hebron. By David, right? etc. But in fact, the Psukim say, All these mentions of Hebron are clearly superfluous, and I just proved it by not saying them, and nobody except for Mel with his buzzer there had any, <laughs> had any problem with what I said. So I think these psukim, these psukim are, 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 are strong indications from the text about the importance of Hebron in this constellation. Okay? But here you see, you ask me when the unity started, right here. Right here, mamash over here. How long did it last? Unfortunately, it lasted for 32 and a half years of David's reign and 40 years of Shlomo's with a few little uh, huh? <laughs> hiccups, and that's it. That was all together, the United Israel. Now you understand why we have to shabbat. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so so we see the, 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 the what we've been showing here. Caleb seeing the importance of the monarchy arising in Hebron because of the Kesher to the forefathers. David having to go through becoming king in Hebron, and it becoming the place where the unity actually takes place. It's only after all this takes place in Hebron, Mamash, the next Pasuk, where it says, then David says, okay, now let's go capture Yebus. Having done what Hebron was supposed to do, we can now, now we can move on to Yerushalayim. I'm just trying to remember that the Hebron is the אבל למה צריכים להזכיר את זה? אבל למה צריכים בכלל לדבר על זה? אה? אני חושבת שה... 
גם העניין של התרבות שנותנים לדוד שנמצא בחברון, משחק פה תפקיד, כי אם אנחנו שמענו אצל יפתח, שראינו שם על הכבוד שהוא לא בא אליי, אז פה כן רואים שאיבדו את דוד כולם, בסדר. נכון, לכן לא צריכים להגיד את זה. לא, אני מסכים איתך. ולכן זה מיותר להגיד את זה, להזכיר את זה. את רוצה להזכיר את זה? את רוצה להזכיר את זה פעם אחת בשבילך. אבל לא שלוש פעמים. טוב. anyway, the importance of unity, I just want to point out, I mean it's quite clear, but חז"ל say in the midrash, נעשו בני ישראל אגודה אחת, when בני ישראל are united, as we see, not, not too often and not for too long, התקינו עצמן לגאולה, then, then we're ready for גאולה, and the, and the proof of the pudding, so to speak, is that it says in ויקרא רבה, דורו של אחיו, כולן עובדי עבודת כוכבים היו. The generation of Achav, Melech Yisrael, were all uh, idolaters. But the fact that they didn't say Lashon Hara, they didn't slander one another, they, they were united. Now the question is always, Achav, if you look at the bottom of the page there, it says, Mi Achav? So the, the, the Pesach in Melachim says about Achav, Vayosef Achav l'asot l'achis et Hashem Elokei Yisrael mikol malchei Yisrael asher hayu lepanav. He was the worst king, and he, he, he was the one that angered God more than any king before him. So then, obviously they say, well, if so, how come he was so successful? Which he was. <laughs> The Midrash says that it was due to the fact that at least among themselves, okay, they were a team. They were united. Nobody would slander or say anything bad about each other. Well, that's an important point. Very important point. That's why we're making it. <laughs> that's why we're very nervous about the situation now. <laughs> well, the only good thing about the situation now is that it's certainly not worse than it ever was before. In any case, uh, I was asked by Tony before, where do we see that, 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 that uh, Kalev in his speech Courteous and, uh, and 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 gracious. Huh? and gracious. gracious. Okay. So first of all, uh, I, I mean, we already pointed this out both tonight and last week uh, about the fact that he doesn't just come by himself. But I even want to look at even look at that word. This is not the first time that a Judean is approaching a Josephite. As a matter of fact, the real Yehuda approached Joseph. Vayigash elav Yehuda. So you may say, well, so what? I mean, how can you compare the two situations? Yosef was prince of Egypt. Yehuda was about to be thrown into prison, or at least Benjamin was about to be thrown into prison. What kind of comparison am I making between this case where Kalev can come to Yoshua and flex his muscles to the case of uh, Yehuda when he comes to Yosef after um, uh, they find the um, Gavia, the goblet in Binyamin's uh, sack. So if you look in Rashi, over there, Vayigash Elav Yehuda, okay? So what does he say? He says, Al yichar apcha biyavdecha ki chamocha kefaro. First he says some 
what sounds like very uh, ingratiating things. You know, don't be upset with me. I just have to say, tell you something. And you know, you're a very important person. You're you're just about as important, to, you know, as Paro. But if you look in Rashi, Rashi says, "Al mikan kashot." From here you see that that Yehuda didn't mink, minx minx <laughs> any words. He, he spoke to Yosef toughly. Worse than that, what does he mean by kicha mochakavaro? So. Rashi says, That's the Poshid understanding of the words, We're, you know, don't look at, don't see us as, you know, a bunch of weaklings here. If we want to, you know. Bread beggars. Bread beggars? I don't know, but don't look us. Don't see us that way, because you know we've we have a history. We've wiped out towns before, and uh, you know Mitzrayim Katanalein. <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is, Yehuda was threatening Yosef even then, even in his bread, whatever it is, beggar uh, status. He he wasn't beneath threatening Yosef, so he could certainly Kalev. When he's Vayikshu, together with Bnei Yehuda, certainly uh, he, he was threatening uh, Yoshua. <laughs> so, so uh, this all brings us back to the question of Kalev and, 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 and Yoshua, because when Moshe says, it does seem that Moshe is opposed to Yoshua, and um, he, he, Moshe himself favors Kalev, and the question is, why would Moshe favor Kalev? After all, Yoshua is his understudy, his faithful, whatever, right? And we already asked, why does Kalev have to beg and threaten to get Hebron? Why is Yoshua opposed? Some of these things we've already answered. And then why does he give Hebron to Kalev? We've answered that Hashem instructed him to, otherwise he wouldn't have. Why is David hesitant to reign in Hebron? That question was asked. And then I'm bringing here a question which I haven't even raised yet. And that is, we're all acquainted or not with the story of David and Naval Hakarmeli. Anybody? Let's start it positively. Is anybody acquainted with the story of David and Naval Hakarmeli? Okay, not bad. To make it short, uh, David, um, before he became king, had this group of merry men that went around um, attacking the rich and giving to the poor. No, that's somebody yeah, else. Yeah, that's that's Robin, Robin Hood. Robin. Uh, something like that. Okay? And um, so there was this guy, Naval Hakarmeli, who had, who was very rich and had a very beautiful and very brilliant, intelligent wife called Abigail. In any case, David, and she was also Nivea. One of seven of you, correct. And uh, he, he and his men take care of Naval's sheep, even though they weren't, it's not clear if they were asked to or they contracted for or not. But the fact remains when David goes to, sends his men to Naval to ask them, ask him to pay up or at least to show his appreciation, uh, Naval sends them off and says, Mise David, Mise Ben Yishai. I know a lot of slaves that, that try to uh, raise up against their masters. It was very not nice. 
Okay, and the question is why is Nabal Kamel antagonistic to David? But that is, perhaps explains why David did not want to go to Hebron. I asked question number three is why is David hesitant to reign in Hebron? And the answer could be that he expected that there was going to be um, opposition to that, to him. The question is why there should be opposition to him. In any case, uh, Kalev, I'm looking at the positive Kalev now, Kalev saw himself reversing the hatred and the jealousy between the brothers, this we said, by connecting the forefathers in the land, and by emphasizing unity. Why do I say that Kalev emphasized unity? Because when he comes back, and he and the, and, and the Muraglim start giving this story, it says, Vayahas Kalev et ha'am el Moshe, Vayomer Alo na'ale v'yarashnu ota ki yachol nuchal la. He included, even in this statement, which he was arguing with the other ten um, Miraglim, his message was, Alo na'ale yachol nuchal. In other words, uh, uh, even in his argumentative state, okay, he was giving an all-inclusive message. The message was, we can do it. That's what your sh That is exactly what is the difference between what Kalev said and what Kalev and Yoshua said, which means Yoshua said it and Kalev agreed. Yoshua and Kalev say, Im chafetz banu Hashem, okay, uh, and they'll take us into the land, then everything will be fine. Kalev doesn't invoke Hashem. Kalev says, we can do it. Now, you may see that as a negative, okay, but we can see that as a definite positive. Time does not allow me to elaborate at this moment. In any case, so what's the reason? The answer to all these questions that I asked is Kina. Kalev himself was jealous of Yahshua. Why did Moshe want Kalev and not Yahshua? Okay, so maybe because Moshe thought that Kalev was a better, a better leader. But listen to this interesting Midrash. Hashem says, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, Hen, I'm reading the Pasuk at the bottom of the page. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, Hen karvu yamech alamut, you're about to die. Krai et Yoshua v'it yatzvu be'ol mo'ed v'atzavenu. Go call Yoshua, and I will command him, because you're finished. Vayelech Moshe v'yoshua v'it yatzvu be'ol mo'ed. The Midrash says, to explain what happened here, says, Moshe says to Hashem, Amar lefanav ribono shel olam, Yitol Yoshua archi sheli ve'ehei chai I agree. Let Yoshua be the leader. But let me live. Why does one have to be connected to the other? You want Yoshua to be the leader? You want Yoshua to bring the people into the land? They said there, but why can't I also go into the land under Yoshua? Nice. Huh? Yes. Who? Moshe? Yes. No, Moshe. No, no, Moshe says to God, just because just because Yoshua is the one that's going to lead the people into the land, why do I have to die and not go into the land because of that? Let, let Yoshua be the leader. In other words, okay, okay, but you have to act towards Yoshua in deference the way Yoshua always acted to you. As a Besharet, Moshe says, fine. Miyad hishkim Moshe, ve'alach lebeito shel Yoshua. Usually the, the servant, you know, the, the, the understudy comes to the master. So Moshe went to the house of Yoshua. Miyad hishkim Moshe, ve'alach lebeito shel Yoshua. Yoshua was suddenly, you know, shocked. Nityare Yoshua, ve'amar, Moshe, Rabbi, bo etzli? Why is my, my, my master Moshe coming to me? Yatsu la'loch, okay, fine. Yes, they went off together, and when they went, Halach Moshe Lismolo Yeshua. The master goes on the right. 
So therefore, Moshe went on the left, which is usually the other way around. Yoshua would go on the left. Yerad Amud Heanan The Amud Enan came down and spoke to Yoshua. And Moshe, standing on the side, not knowing what's going on. Mishenistalek Amud Heanan Ahalach Moshe etzel Yoshua Vamar Moshe says to Yoshua, so I see that God spoke to you in the Amud. So what did he say? Amalo Yoshua, Keshaya Dibur Nigla Alecha. Yodea Hayiti Ma Medaberimcha. When when God spoke to you, you told me what he said? No. Ota Sha Saak Moshe Vyamar Me Amitot. I rather die a hundred times velo kina achat. He saw how jealous he had become. So he said, it's better to die. In other words, he's rejecting the offer. He's saying it's better to die even a hundred times rather than that this should be the situation which will for sure make me more and more jealous of Yoshua. And Shlomo in Shira Shirim Mefarashes the Posuk, Ki Aza Kamavet Ava, Kasha Kisheol Kina, Ahava Shahav Moshe Yoshua. Which Ava are we talking about, which is very strong, is the love of Moshe to Yoshua. But what is even stronger and is hard as hell, Kasha Kisheol Kina. Jealousy trumps love easily. So basically the message is that all the answers to the previous slide of why this one did this and why this one did that and why this and why that, all and why we have Tisha B'Av because they hated, the brothers hated him because he wanted to become king. All has to do with Kina. Just one little thing. When you left Moshe be Yoshua, so that is the thing where they didn't go with one heart. Where? When you left Moshe be Yoshua. No, at that point. No, at that point, they, I guess they went. Okay, until he realized that he's going as a... When you told Moshe his hand, very possible. Very possible. Either that or to show how unsuitable Yoshua was that he has to put two hands on him. Yeah. <laughs> In any case, uh, I wish everyone a meaningful Tisha B'Av and an enjoyable summer because we're going to take a break. And after the vacation, we'll finish off Hebron. If there's anything still missing, certainly you want to talk about Hebron. Certainly from that time till today, a lot of things happened in Hebron. Hebron didn't stop. Okay? We have to understand the Mi'arata Machpila because we want to visit there and there's a lot of interesting things that happened there. Uh, you know, where is the cave underneath? Did anybody ever go down there? What did they see? And after all at that, we'll visit Hebron, and after that, we'll start a new cycle. So <laughs> Of course. Uh, 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 uh